happy to uh, introduce Rosemary Williams from Oregon State University. Um, she spent uh, a summer at NASA Marshall's uh, Space Flight Center, and she's going to be telling us about her internship. And we're really excited because she's going to be uh, delivering her presentation from Spain. So everybody give a warm welcome to Rosemary. <laughs> Out of the back of the rocket and generate 
a lot of breath. And this whole thing is gonna happen 10 times a second, which is pretty incredible. So, okay, I can kind of see you guys if you, perfect. Okay, we're not gonna watch it again then. <laughs> um, um, so that's the, that's the rope mechanics or anything, but that's, that's what um, my boss, Robert Adams, presented when he wanted this concept to give to me. My part, I had two parts and they were both the injection system. The first was the uranium target injection system. Um, so my idea was to use a rail gun, which is one of kind of the most basic concepts in physics. It also uses the right hand rules, like my favorite rule right now. Um, so essentially what you have is you're gonna have, have these two rails and then not pictured, you're gonna have a capacitor and a power source. The power source is going to charge the capacitor and then these two rods, one of them is going to be positively charged and one of them is going to be negatively charged. And the left electrons want to move from positive to, well, it's not actually the electrons because we just kind of messed things up a long time ago. So it's not actually the protons that are moving, but we pretend that the protons are moving. It's really confusing. We're just going to say the current wants to flow from the positive to the negative terminal so that our right hand rule works. Um, and so if the electrons are flowing from positive to negative and these rods are green target, down in between these wires, which also connects electricity, you're gonna kind of complete that circuit and you're gonna allow your electrons or protons, you know, to flow from the positive to the negative terminals. This movement of particles is going to create a B field. Following our right hand rule, if they're if they wow, it's really hard to do this without pointing at anything on the screen, you guys. If they're flowing down the <laughs> positive rod, you're gonna have current going this way and then you're gonna have your E field generated going like this. So you'll notice on both of the rods, in the center between them, your B field is pointing upwards. Your B field is your magnetic field. So you have your B field pointed upwards. In the uranium target, the current is going back into the screen almost. So if you have your current going back into your screen like this, you're gonna have your B field upward, and then you're gonna have your resultant force this way. So it's just using the basic principle in physics to kind of show that the uranium target will be forced out of these rods. And the cool thing about um, using a railgun is that it doesn't really require a lot of mechanical systems. You don't need um, something like this, kind of rotating and pushing your targets 130,000 times, which is the number of shots that we would need to get to Mars. So that was my idea um, to use, because I think that railguns are super cool. Um, the, the things I had to do in my internship were to um, research how conductive and resistive uranium is, how conductive and resistive the core that we would want to use, which is lithium deuteride, um, and how that would affect how fast we would go, the buildup of uranium dust that might happen, because you really don't want particles of uranium floating around our rocket, that would be really not be the greatest. Um, and then also, <laughs> railguns create a lot of energy. They are super powerful. Um, and so they create a lot of energy and they do put a lot of strain on the rods. And so we were trying to figure out if they could do something like this 10 times per second and 130,000 times in total. So, oh, yeah. Oh, and then the other complicated thing about this is that is calculating where the uranium target will be at a given distance because we know that rods, like the rods that we would use, have resistance. And the farther that the uranium target moves on the rod, the longer, the, like the greater distance there is from the capacitor to the target, which means there's gonna be more resistance. So there's gonna be more resistance in the circuit as the uranium target is moving, and it's all kind of dependent on each other and very complicated. And I derived the equations while I was there. It took me two weeks, but I did it. It was a pretty terrible two weeks, but you know, math can be fun sometimes um, to figure out where the uranium <laughs> target would be at any given point in time. This is what my friend and fellow intern, Augustin Demonso did. We both did two different concepts and concepts and like bounced ideas off of each other and figured out what was wrong with um, the downsides of both of them and the upsides of them. His was just kind of a mechanical arm that would push the uranium targets out of the system. The problem with this one, kind of like with the railgun, is that there's no um, there's no convection in the space, so there, there's no air to kind of help heat move around. So any heat that's generated is just gonna stay in those rods and make them heat up in the same with um, a mechanical system like this. 
second part of the project I worked on, which was a liquid, liquid lithium injection system. We called it the LLIS, and it was trying to figure out how to get the liquid lithium to converge a, a triangular cone and then kind of like a long like paper towel kind of cone, how to get them also to meet 10 times per second at the same time that the uranium pellet would reach the, the, the focal point of our nozzle. So we chose lithium because it's highly conductive. Um, we chose it because it's, um, yeah, it's highly conductive, it's pretty cheap. Um, and so our big problem was trying to figure out if we should keep the liquid lithium in its solid state or in its liquid state. I had this idea that I have to talk about because I love this idea. It's called the bagel. I don't really remember what it means, but I was super excited about it, but it was shot down pretty quickly because of what I'm about to tell you. It was essentially, we have a big core of solid lithium, and then we have kind of like a, a big hot plate that would push up through the lithium and have holes in it. Kind of looks like the bagel, it's just like a hot plate, it's like sesame seeds kind of, you know, push up. And then as it melted the liquid lithium, the liquid lithium would just kind of like pour out of the holes and it's just um, secondary tanks. So what we found out is the second that we got the plate hot enough to um, melt the lithium, it would have melted the entire block of lithium because it's so conductive. So we really didn't need an entire system or my bagel to, um, to melt it. So we discovered that it's actually not that difficult or energy intensive to just keep the lithium and liquid throughout the entire flight. Um, and then we're gonna use helium tanks um, because helium is a noble gas, it's not gonna react with the lithium. We're gonna use helium tanks, helium tanks to um, inject helium into the lithium tank. You can kind of see it, it's a toroidal shape down there at the bottom right hand corner to inject into that tank and force the lithium out into the injection holes. Yes, does anyone have any questions about that? <laughs> um, I believe I've talked everything there. So we're getting into the realm of things that I don't really know a lot about. I didn't work on these parts of the project, but they're important for the rocket system as a whole, so I will try my best to describe them. So what I talked about earlier of having those huge currents pulse through the liquid lithium and compress the uranium, we have to have very large currents to create that kind of power to actually um, cause the uranium to fission. So um, the pulsing that we're using, essentially we like to think about it as a whole bunch of little buckets of water where the water is like the charge that all fill up and then they jump into another bucket and then buckets those side all fill up and then dump into another larger bucket. So you're essentially, you have all of these little capacitors that are all gonna discharge into bigger capacitors and bigger ones until we shoot out a whole lot of energy. And we're gonna do that 10 times per second too as well. So it's, um, it'll be difficult, but that's not really my problem since I'm, I, you know, I did it this summer. So it's, it's done now. Anyways, so that's the pulsar. The other parts are the cooling systems. Uh, there, it's a, it's a nuclear blast. Like, let's be real. It's going to create a lot of energy and a lot of heat and a lot of photons, and those are going to damage our ship if we don't figure out how to um, disperse those throughout the ship. So we're going to have uh, salts, liquid salts, go through the nozzle and carry the heat back and just kind of flow back. And we're actually going to use that heat to keep the lithium tanks throughout the journey. So we're kind of trying to reuse all of the energy in the system to make it as efficient as possible. So that's the very simple cooling system. We also have a lot of radiators. They are very large. They take up about half a cup. I don't know if you can see the big tall rectangles at the top, but those are our radiators that are radiating all of that heat into space. Um, the nozzle, that was also a very complicated one because it involves we have the coils and then our right hand rule that's creating a magnetic field that'll force the plasma out of the nozzle. But then the, the plasma itself is also gonna create a magnetic field um, that's going to push out and it's going to recharge those coils. And I really don't know the physics behind that because it took my intern partner about 10 weeks to figure that out and I was doing other things in those 10 weeks, but we're just gonna trust her and they recharge and it's great. 
And then the uranium target storage, we use MCMP to model how to store the uranium targets because if you know anything about uranium, it's very great to be lack it and do anything bad. So we have to figure out how to store it all. And I can't tell you how we store it all. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Not because I don't know, but I don't think I'm allowed to. Anyways, the acknowledgements and conclusion, my team was super, super awesome. Love them all, Kim, John, Elena, and Augustine. One of my bosses, Robert Adams and Glenn Doty. I was really excited to have professional pictures of at the, the symposium that we have at the end of the internship, but unfortunately, the only one they got of me is me eating a popsicle, which you can see at the top, which is kind of a bummer, but it's also pretty hilarious. Yes, any questions? I can't hear anything for anyone. <laughs> So um, what's the minimum distance from Earth before this evolving system can be activated? So the question. No, I can't. Can you hear me through this? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, repeat the question. What's the minimum distance from Earth before uh, Puff can be activated? So the question was, what is the minimum distance from Earth before a puff can be activated? I could make up a number for you. <laughs> I, I don't know. Oh, um, it's definitely, I'm assuming, also we don't want it at like the same level as the International Space Station because we don't want the International Space Station. So probably a higher orbit. I don't really know. I can make up a number if that would make you happy. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's an acceptable response. Do we have any other questions? <laughs> any other questions for the speaker? Do we have any other questions? All right. If we don't, we'll say thank you very much, Rosemary, for that fantastic presentation. And uh, I guess we'll start. Uh, Letting our next speaker set up, that will be Kevin Lee from the University of Oregon, who will be speaking on improving MSL's operational efficiency by re-examining margining policies. That sounds great. So thank you so much, Rosemary, for your time.